It's pretty nice music, isn't it? This is through a cat's ear. It's scientifically developed in sync with the natural rhythms in a cat's brain of alpha waves to promote more calming alpha waves. It isn't the one silver bullet that fixes all nervous cats, but it can be helpful. And I'm gonna talk about it in just a minute, a little bit more. Carolyn, can I hand you back this, this iPad? Nope, over here. Okay, there we go. All right. Oh, Cindy, wonderful. Thank you for coming. It's excellent to see you again. So, I, I'm a pet guy. I think that's probably pretty clear. I'm also a car guy. But these two cats of ours, they're not car guys. Not by their choice, anyway. But just last week, I took Tony here to a veterinary hospital for a treatment that saved his life. And we'll talk about that. And he looks pretty darn good, doesn't he? Snarfing away at little, little treats in these little indoor hunting feeders for cats. And if you've had a problem with your cat freaking out in the car, complaining, yowling, sometimes losing their urine and stool, um, it can be pretty miserable for them in the car because they have no concept. And if you've had that experience, would you put it in the comment line and tell me about it? And we'll talk about it during this Facebook Live. Um, by the way, if anybody hasn't met me before, I'm Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm a veterinarian. I'm a veterinary behaviorist, residency trained in that specialty, but with lots of years of experience in general practice. And since I've been in this line of work since 1975, I don't know that there's anything I haven't seen yet. Probably a few things, not a lot. Uh, so if there are any questions about cats and dogs, about physical or behavioral issues of any kind at all, by all means, type it in. It doesn't have to be on the topic that we're talking about tonight. I want to talk tonight about car travel and cats um, because you absolutely, unless you live next door to a veterinary clinic um, or you travel by bus, the, um, the car is the only way you're going to get your, your cat in for medical treatment. And that's mighty important. There's a real problem recently with um, veterinary visits for cats being way down. More dog parents are taking their dogs to the veterinary clinic, but fewer cats. And that's a really big problem because people have this misconception that cats take care of themselves, that they don't really need medical care, and they really hate going. Um, and the people, it's miserable for them too. And you think, well, gee, do we really need to be doing this? And so people aren't. And of course, especially now with uh, social distancing requirements, um, going to the veterinary clinic with people, with your cat, seems like the last thing you're going to do. Well, the trouble is that cats are socially very different creatures than dogs, and they are predators, but they're also a prey species, and they still think they're kind of in the wild, even though our, their domestic pets will live with us. Uh, well, the bottom line is that they really don't communicate when they need help. They tend to hide it. And so consequently, we have cats who are getting gradually sicker in many cases, especially as they get elderly, and their people don't know it. These are people who love their cats, but why go to the veterinary clinic things seem okay? Well, we're gonna talk about Tony here in a few minutes because he really needed medical care. And we'll talk about why I didn't do it because, uh, well, we'll talk about that. And I took him to a specialist in that, in that field of veterinary medicine. Um, so, uh, by the way, if you're going to take a cat in a uh, in the veterinary clinic to in a carrier, and you have to have a carrier, we'll talk more about this. This is something that can make a big difference, and it's called feel away. Let me turn the camera around so you can see it. There you go. This is a synthetic analog of a naturally occurring pheromone, um, and it comes in a spray. And you can spray this on the pad in the bottom of your cat carrier. And then you can play through a cat's ear music. Excuse me, girlfriend, you're snacking? All pets snack around here if they get the chance, don't they? Yes, I don't, we don't care what species we are. We're snackers. Um, hold on here. I've got my microphone wire wrapped around my border collie. Oops. be helpful if I turn the camera back around, wouldn't it? There we go. All right. We're back. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so anyway, you can spray the feel away spray on the pad in the cat's carrier. And it's one more thing that helps. And the through the cat's ear music, 
Um, you can uh, download that from the internet uh, and you can play it on a CD and of course if you have like a tablet or, an, or a smartphone you can play it in the car and it's between these things it helps I'm going to share a few more things that can help we don't hope to make it easier for a cat to travel simply by doing one thing we use what we call multimodal therapy which is multiple things that all uh, interrelate and so on that, I'd like to read you a, a newspaper column. This is not newspaper. I printed it out on a piece of paper. <laughs> and um, I put this in the Albuquerque Journal about a month ago. I write a column every week. And um, the information in here is sort of to the point. So bear with me. I'd like to read it to you. Here's the question that I got from one of my readers. And people send me questions on my Facebook page, which you're welcome to do. We have a cross-country move at the end of the summer and are curious what recommendations you have for, for moving with kitties. We have two, 11 years and 14 years old, both of whom we adopted while living here in Georgia. And uh, you know, the beauty of Facebook is you can kind of participate from anywhere. So now we're moving back to my home state of Minnesota. The cats do not enjoy short car rides to our local veterinary clinic and likely won't be thrilled with our 17-hour drive. And I would say, well, no, not, you know, the truth is we're not ever going to get them to be thrilled, but at least if they can accept it and relax and not get stressed, we've made a big difference. So this was my response. Cats can be vocal and highly stressed car travelers. Are we there yet? You know the drill. But it's the unpredictable motion the noise and a feeling of vulnerability that trigger anxiety. Not drinking, eating, or eliminating can lead to trouble, especially on a long drive like that. You can get a dehydrated cat. Cat carriers should be big enough to allow movement while providing a sense of a hidden den. Cover the carriers with sheets so your reluctant travelers can only see out the bottom of the doors. Locate the carriers on the floor of the car to reduce queasiness. The higher up it is, very typically, the more nervous they get. Now, there are exceptions to that, and you, you do trial and error with the individual. Um, but what's really important is that so many of these carriers nowadays are pretty, you know, the cats can't see out of them much, and you don't want them to see out of it really at all. If they can see out the bottom of the door area, that's pretty good. But in fact, they don't really need that as much as a dog does. But when they can't see what's going on and they feel that enclosed snugness of a hidden area, that can make a very big difference for cats, along with through a dog's ear and some feel-away spray. Okay, So cats on the move may also suffer from motion sickness, in which it can be recognized by constant drooling or occasional vomiting. Typically, anxiety does not cause drooling and vomiting. A safe over-the-counter preventative like Bonine, which is the brand name, B-O-N-I-N-E, and the generic name of the medication that's over-the-counter, you don't need a prescription, is Meclizine, M-E-C-L-I-Z-I-N-E. And Meclizine comes in a tablet, and you can give a half of a 25 milligram tablet to a cat one to two hours before loading everybody into the car. Um, if your kitties cry, yowl, or hide under the pad in their carriers, they may do better with an anti-anxiety medication given ahead of a white-knuckle ride. That was a harsh indictment, wasn't it? You'll be driving gently at your cats, who believe that they've been abducted by Mad Max. Your veterinarian can prescribe 100 milligram gabapentin capsules. And let me show you, it just not that this is a prescription medication. And again, your veterinarian will have to prescribe it or dispense it. But there's the name, G-A-B-A-P-E-N-T-I-N, and it's the 100 milligram strength that you want. And uh, just write that down if you want to, okay? Well, um, excuse me, girlfriend. There we go. Um, so anyway, uh, gabapentin, what the beauty of this is, and this isn't the case with all cats, of course, but most cats, you can open the capsules. This is a, a capsule, not a tablet. And so it um, looks like this just a capsule, and you can open it up and you dump the contents on a little bit of soft cat food or moistened dry food, and cats typically like the taste. And they'll scarf down the full 100 milligrams and they get nice and relaxed and a little bit sedated, which 
can go a long way. Um, so, um, but you know, toys and things like that, chew, or, uh, I'm sorry, food dispensing toys can be very helpful. Um, I have one, uh, Carolyn, would you hand me a fish? Uh, now, Gaston, the white guy, does not like the fish, but some cats are genetically predisposed to get off on catnip. That's why it doesn't work on everybody. And Tony here is a catnip loving guy. Tony, here you go, baby. And, uh, and this little fish, it's kind of a kick in the pants. Let me, yeah, Tony says, I'll take it. Well, like any self-respecting trout, this is a uh, active little toy. And I think we got these on the internet, right, Carolyn? Yeah. Uh, what, <clears throat> what, do you, what do you look for? Catfish or what do people? Yeah. Cat, catfish, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, Tony doesn't seem to think that's that interesting. Gaston says, man, all that active movement's not for me. Tony, he's more interested in another toy. It'll stop flopping here in a minute. There you go. Anyway, um, so, uh, you know, trial and error. Put your cat in there, take short trips. If your cat will eat from a food dispensing toy, um, you can do that. If it's uh, something like this with catnip, you can go that way. Um, also, there's another thing that is meant for dogs. It's actually approved for use as a, uh, for dogs with noise phobias, and it's called Cilio. And you think, why am I talking about a dog medication with cats? Well, it is not approved for cats, but it's very safe in cats. And it comes in a syringe, and the plunger of the syringe is just marked with dots. It's a gel, and you put a little dab, one dot of it, between the uh, lower lip and the gum. Hold the cat's mouth just closed for a couple minutes, and it'll absorb. And that can make a very big difference in car travel and reducing the anxiety. It lasts for a couple of hours. It'll do a good job. The one thing you want to avoid, on the other hand, is an old-fashioned tranquilizer called acepromazine. And some veterinarians, they're not trained in behavior medicine, um, and they may say, well, here, we can dispense some acepromazine or ace, it's a tablet. And the trouble with acepromazine is that it has essentially no or very, very little anti-anxiety properties to it. It's basically an old-fashioned sedative. And the problem with sedating a cat with acepromazine for car travel is that they uh, become incapacitated. They look like they're resting. They look like they're quiet and relaxed when in fact they are not capable of moving hardly at all. And because the, the brain is on warp drive, because they're highly anxious, especially because they're incapable of manifesting or physically acting out their anxiety because they're sedated by the acepromazine. And these cats are essentially in a chemical straitjacket. And while they might look okay, they tend to get worse because they're still conscious enough to recognize how freaked out they are. So acepromazine, don't do it. Gabapentin, extremely safe. It's about as safe as any medication we have, literally. Um, and it's so easy to give. Uh, or you can use Cilio. And so that was, I suggested to these folks on their move across country that they do some around the town errands with their cats and experiment with different, uh, these different treatments. Um, but the cats should be, carry, uh, should be moved in separate carriers. They need to have their own little hiding place. Many people make assumptions about their cat's social nature. Uh, they're not social the way we are and the way dogs are. They're a very different creature, and you have to recognize that you have to handle them differently. Um, so what about, uh, what about Tony? Tony T, you're back on the floor. He'll be back up here in a minute. Um, Tony? Are you coming back? Oh, here. Here's the other fish. Anyway, you don't want that. All right. Anyway. Um, whoops. Cats don't always cooperate the way you want them to. This fish isn't cooperating very well either. Here, let me turn it off. There we go. So, um, anyway, would you mind reloading my, my cat feeders, Carolyn? They're, uh, thank you. So, anyways, so here's Tony. About a year ago, uh, well, he's pushing 15 this year. He'll be 15 in November. Um, and throughout my pet's lives, I examine them often. And when they become around eight or so, I start doing annual blood profiles because we're looking for the kinds of things that start to be more prone to occur in older pets. 
And here he was well, about 13, 14, and his annual profile for an older cat should include a, a thyroid screen, what's called a T4. And your veterinarian will know what a T4 means because we all do it on older cats. And the reason is that as many as 10% of cats over age nine develop benign tumors of their thyroid glands. Well, the good news is that they're benign and they nearly all respond very well to treatment. And there's a few different treatment choices, but here's the problem. If we have a cat who's got these developing benign tumors of the thyroid glands, which put out excessive levels of thyroid hormone, then among other problems in the body, it triggers the sympathetic, the fight or flight side of the autonomic nervous system with adrenaline, and it gradually causes more and more activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And these cats' heart rates begin to accelerate and they start to eat more but lose weight. Many of them have uh, poor hair coats. Uh, their liver enzymes will start to spike. A few of them developed some pretty nasty behavior changes. Well, one of the most scary parts of this thing is the way hyperthyroidism is what this is called with excessive thyroid hormone levels, it can affect the heart muscle and cause what's called cardiomyopathy, and this can kill. Um, not to mention that they get skinny enough. Well, so, you know, here was Tony about a year, and a, about a year ago. His thyroid T4 screen uh, began to rise, and I thought, guy's got hyperthyroidism. Not a big surprise because it's common in older cats. So we started him on an oral tablet called methimazole, um, typically very safe, and it reduces the production of thyroid hormone by the thyroid glands. It doesn't slow down the underlying cause, but it reduces the production of the thyroid hormone, so typically cats who take this tablet are going to be uh, feel okay. And what we're doing really is buying time because we need the thyroid tumors to get big enough to where a real curative treatment can put it to rest. And we really do have a cure. Now, until several years ago, we used to go in surgically and remove these. Um, and I've done a lot of those procedures. And most cats do well with those, but there can be risks. But we have radioactive iodine treatments now. This is what's called nuclear medicine. And it is not available everywhere, although veterinary teaching hospitals have it. And there aren't a whole lot of those. There are about 28 or so of those in the country now. But radioactive iodine, and the beauty of this stuff, iodine, is that there's just about only one place in the body that manages iodine, and those are the thyroid glands. Thank you for the hearts, by the way. It tells me I'm saying something useful here. Well, um, but this iodine, unlike the iodine that's in our food, is tagged with a radioactive element. So when this stuff is given by injection just under the skin, the blood picks it up, it goes right to the thyroid glands and properly dosed, it destroys a significant amount of the thyroid glands. Well, if you give that too early in the game, then you destroy too much of the thyroids or maybe even all of them, and then you have to keep the cat on a thyroid supplement for the rest of its life, which we'd rather not do. Well, there is a veterinary hospital right here in Albuquerque. It's a VCA hospital called the VCA Veterinary Care Animal Hospital. And one of their doctors there is licensed to use radioactive iodine. Well, she's the only doctor in the whole state, veterinarian, who is licensed to use that stuff. There's a lot of training and, and she's gone down that path and she has the special licensing and equipment and procedures because if anybody on the staff gets exposed to it, well, it can absorb through their skin and break down their thyroid glands. So you gotta be very careful with this stuff. So. Here was Tony on the methimazole. Well, all medications, of course, have the potential for side effects. And I've used lots of methimazole in hyperthyroid cats in my years in practice because I've seen so many of these cases. But this little rascal here was one of the ones who started to develop a poor appetite because of the medication. So I'm sort of between a rock and a hard place here. On one hand, I need to control the output of thyroid hormone while I allow those thyroid tumors to get big enough to be safely treated. But I've got a kitty who's not, who's not eating very well because of the medication and is always losing weight. So this is a difficult problem and he got down to about six and a half pounds. So um, 
we went ahead and took him off the methimazole and gave him a month for his thyroid blood levels to rise to a true level, un, not influenced by the methimazole, and tested him and he was plenty high enough. So I contacted Dr. Don Nolan, N-O-L-A-N, at the VCA Veterinary Care Animal Hospital in Albuquerque, and I said, Dr. Nolan, of course, we're on a first name basis because we're colleagues, and I said, Don, um, Little Tony here, his thyroid level is, has spiked. She and I had talked about his case and she was advising me on it. And uh, so she said, wonderful, let's get him in there. So last Wednesday, I brought Tony over, uh, left him there in the morning, and they gave him his injection under the skin. And she has staff that are very specially trained and they wear essentially a hazmat suit and they keep the cats who are being treated in a special little ward all by themselves and they have special approved methods for disposing of uh, urine in the litter pan so that nobody gets contaminated with this stuff. And then they test them uh, daily to see where their thyroid, where their radioactive level is because they don't want to release them to home and then put the family at risk. So he was actually able to eliminate enough of the radiation uh, just in a couple days. And so on Friday of last week, um, I picked him up and the whole family has noticed that, well, he's taking better care of his coat, he's eating well, and we're going to be weighing him weekly. I think we're going to see his weight start to creep back up to normal, but he's been feeling better. In fact, just the other day, I was here in my office at home, and I was on the floor picking something up, and he was sitting here on the corner of the table, and as my head went past his, I noticed that he was purring. Well, what I hadn't noticed gradually had occurred over the last year or so is that he had stopped purring. And it was one of those gradual changes that nobody in the family had picked up on until he started doing it again. And what that's telling me is that I missed that, but I've also got a cat who's feeling better. Well, because he's not jacked up and speeding all the time because of these excessive thyroid hormone levels. Well, his quality of life is a lot better, but of course, we couldn't do any of this for Tony if I couldn't take him down there in the car. And my point in part of this story is that if you have a cat of any age, it needs annual exams, but especially as they get older, they not only need to be examined, but they need lab profiles because he just wouldn't gonna last that long. His cardiomyopathy, a heart disease, would have killed him while he was miserable from all those excessive thyroid hormones in his system. So, so how do we get him there? Well, I carry him in a crate, but you know it's got a handle at the top? We don't use the handle. We cover the crate, but we carry the crate against our chest. And the reason is that with a handle, as much as, as careful as you try to be, there's some sway in the carrier. And boy, that's not something cats understand how to manage at all. So we hold that carrier against our chest with both arms and we cover, we cover it and he feels much better. The other thing I've learned about Tony is that when I have him in the carrier, I have him in the passenger seat right next to me while I'm driving, and I can talk to him then. And we'll play through a dog's ear music, but my voice really helps calm him. So I've got a little research paper I want to read you just a couple of brief passages from, and this is from the Journal of Veterinary Behavior, and specialists like me get, uh, we're subscribers to this stuff. And you notice that this is local synchrony as a tool to estimate affiliation in dogs. Well, here I am again with a different species. Well, it turns out that affiliative behavior is something seen in any so social species. This particular research was done on dogs. And so let me just read you a few passages. Affiliation, that means social connectedness. If you like somebody or love somebody, then that's affiliative. And so when we pet our cats and dogs, uh, when we share affection with another person, that's affiliative behavior, okay? So affiliation between individuals is socially adaptive, meaning that they can fit into their social environment better when there's affection and other signals of friendship, um, as it helps to build and maintain bonds between group members and is central to social cohesion in other words, keeping the group together. One of the main factors in creating and maintaining affiliation <clears throat> is behavioral synchronization, particularly local synchrony, which is defined as being in the same place as the other individuals, whatever the activity. 
And they've seen dogs in groups outside and cattle and horses. And cats will do the same thing, but again, they're different socially than other species, but they do have synchrony. In other words, they'll sort of do the same thing when they're together. Now, here's the, a couple more passages, if you'll bear with me. To remain stable, a group needs to have a strong social cohesion between individual group members. This depends on various factors attracting individuals toward each other and keeping them in a coordinated social unit. Now here's the last point that I'd like to share with you. Synchronization is strengthened when group members are close to, e pardon me, close to each other. Moving together to the same places prevents group members from becoming isolated from each other, thus increasing their survival chances through a better visual chemical and vocal communication. They communicate chemically with pheromones they're released by specialized glands in the air. And cats do this especially with pheromones that are released by glands in their cheeks. And you notice the cats will rub their cheeks sometimes on other cats or against furniture. Well, they're sharing these pheromones that are communicating to the other cats in the group. Well, when I took Tony to the VCA Veterinary uh, Care Animal Hospital, I had Dr. Nolan uh, give him his, his radioactive iodine treatment. I didn't bring our other cat Gaston with him um, and you know again they shouldn't be traveling in the same carrier because they would trigger each other's anxiety. Well Tony and I go back almost 15 years and having his carrier right next to me uh, in the car and talking with him and knowing that I was close by. I'm not pretending that you know he thinks he's human or that I believe I'm a cat although there are some similarities between me and Tony, um, I wanted him to know that he was not alone and that I was calling upon the bond that he and I have developed with after all these years and using a calm and quiet tone and driving the car gently, and not making quick corners and doing anything that would upset him. I was making it a point to just share with him that we were close by, that we were members of the same group. And this kind of research underscores the value of talking quietly. Don't use these high-pitched, happy voices. Very quiet. And you don't have to talk continually. Um, so another important point I'm going to share with you before, before we put an end to our little meeting here is that many veterinary hospitals are... Oh. Oh, Mona. Let me finish what I'm saying here and let me get to your question next and I really appreciate your question. Um, is that some veterinary hospitals are certified fear-free and fear-free is a training organization that teaches not just veterinarians and their staffs but you can become a fear-free certified pet groomer, pet trainer, or pet parent and they have online training for each of these groups. Well, fear-free certified veterinary uh, clinics and their staffs <clears throat> understand how to handle cats and dogs in ways that minimize the stress. Not just because it's kind to be nice. Uh, we all love pets, and so it's not a, not a reach for us to, to buy into that. But, <clears throat> but we also, if we can avoid stress, then we can reduce the challenge to their immune system, reduce the risk of other physical disease, because of stress. And so fear-free veterinary clinics are frankly the way to go for any pet. Um, I got myself certified fear-free and I, uh, there are vet other veterinary clinics here in Albuquerque and wherever you live in the country, if you go to fearfreepets.com, you'll find a locator in there and you can find fear-free veterinary clinics. And so for example, one thing that we can do, especially with cats who are particularly nervous about sitting and waiting in the reception area of a veterinary clinic where they have um, dogs barking and other cats putting out pheromones that communicate their fear and your cat will pick that up too. We don't need that. <clears throat> and so a procedure that any fear-free veterinary clinic is definitely going to be hip to because it's part of their training is that you've made your appointment, you arrive in the parking lot, your cat's in the carrier, and you call their reception desk from your cellular phone. And you say, we've arrived, and what we want to do is that you folks, when you're ready for us in the exam room, we want to have you call me, the pet parent, the cat parent, on the cellular phone, 
and we will simply carry in your arms the cat carrier directly through the front door, right through the reception room, right to the exam room, close the door. And what you've avoided is your cat sitting, waiting in the reception room with all that racket going on. It doesn't eliminate the stress, but it sure can diminish it. So that's a great fear-free technique. Um, and I would, uh, I would love to see more people do that. And frankly, I'd like to see a lot more veterinary clinics become fear-free. So, um, see if I can, oh, there we go, Mona. Six years ago, when I brought my new cat home in a carrier from the Humane Society, she became agitated and defecated on herself. That's a very scared cat. In the years since, she has repeated this behavior every time she's been transported in the car. Where does this behavior come from? Does the anxiety stem from early trauma? It certainly can, and that's a really valuable point, Mona, because we cats can have what's called classical conditioning. This is Pavlovian, you know, like Pavlov's dogs. And classical conditioning is emotion-based, and it is a connection that is not specifically taught. In other words, when this occurs, then this emotion occurs. You remember with Pavlov's dogs, they heard a bell, and they started to salivate anticipating food. It was a physiologic response to really an, what we call an unconditioned or untrained stimulus, something neutral like, in that case, the sound of a bell. Well, so your cat got into a car and it may not have been that scary until this car started to move and the cat might not even have even been in a carrier and was fending for itself or was in a carrier and up high and looking out the windows and getting freaked out. Um, because, you know, people don't know. People aren't intentionally mean to pets. They just don't know. Um, and then when it ended up at the veterinary clinic, if that's the only place a cat ever goes when it gets in the car, and the veterinary clinic, the staff, is not trained in fear-free methods, and they don't mean to scare pets, but that is the end result because they, they haven't been taught how not to. And so only a couple of trips in the car, and that cat becomes classically conditioned. That cat knows that, oh my goodness, when I see the carrier come out or I see them carrying me into the car, holy smoke, I'm freaking out. Well, something important that we know about the brain, it's what's called a plastic organ. And what that means is that it can change. Its anatomy can change permanently. Believe it or not, it really does. And so with repetition of a ramp up and arousal where there's a very specific trigger, um, then it's just like an athlete or a musician who practices, practices, practices thousands of times. Well, they get to be world class, don't they? Well, nowadays with modern brain imaging methods like fMRIs and PET scans, we can actually measure the size of the neural circuits, how wide they are and how strong the synapses are and how many inhibitory and excitatory neural inputs there are that strengthen and speed the neurologic responses in the brain. And emotions are a very big part of this. So if your cat has been through this a number of times, Mona, then, you know, cause and effect, the cat knows what to expect. And it's very important for cats like this to have their management changed in the ways that we've talked about. But I would strongly urge you to ask your veterinarian to prescribe gabapentin and use that not as a treatment when the problem is already occurring, but preemptively about an hour or two before going and try it uh, a few times with very short trips to see how your cat deals with it. And if it's not enough, we can increase the dose. Again, this stuff is very safe. Or we can add cilio, this gel between the gum and the lower, uh, the lower lip. Uh, there are a few other treatments as well. There are uh, medication called trazodone. Um, we've absolutely got to help these pets feel better. And these treatments are safe and it can lower the, uh, the intensity of the fear that these pets feel. And, uh, you know, part of empathy, isn't it? You know, empathy is walking a mile in the other person's moccasins. Well, you know, these are not people, are they? It's hard enough for me sometimes to see a person who's behaving differently than I would under a particular circumstance and go, wait a minute, I have no business judging that person for responding differently in ways that I don't even like because I don't know what they've been through. I don't know what their life history has been. Well, that's another human who's a member of my species. And it's one thing to 
try to walk in that person's moccasins, but with cats, they're a very different species. Dogs are different, but cats are very different. And so we have to learn what it takes to be empathic and be kind to them and set them up for success. And so reducing the sensory input, and again, playing like through, through a dog's ear can be very helpful. Now, another question just came in. And uh, Rosemary, hi, Dr. Nickel. The letter you read was from my daughter inquiring about moving her kitties. I helped them with the move about 10 days ago and the kitties, Annie and Judith, I had not known the cat's names, did really well. Oh, I'm delighted on the two day drive. Thanks to your recommendations. So glad to have my daughter, son-in-law and grand kitties in Minnesota now. Thank you for your help. You know, that really, that really warms my heart, Rosemary. Thank you so much. I'm just, you know, hearing a success story really is valuable and I'm just delighted that it made a difference. And these kinds of management approaches help a lot more when you have a cat who's not already got a history of rep repetition and ramp ups and fear. So, you know, back to what you were suggesting, Mona, um, when we've got a cat who's mistakenly gone through this a number of times, that's when we really need to add the medication. So I'm just delighted that this stuff can work. How about talk about uh, pica in cats and ways to manage it from K. Pica is a, uh, it's probably Latin, you know, a lot of these medical terms. And by definition, pica is consuming or trying to eat or chew non-food items. I'll tell you who's gonna be really bad about that is livestock sometimes. But cats and dogs can do it. Dogs can be bad about, some have swallowed rocks, um, toys, I have taken those out surgically. I've removed them using an endoscope. Um, Tony here, who's on the floor scratching the rug right now, being a cat, and Gaston is up here. Um, Tony, are you coming back up? It looks like he's coming back up. Okay, here he comes. Um, Tony has a long-term habit of eating a lot of grass and vomiting it. And in fact, he has chewed fabric. Um, and one day, he suddenly stopped eating. And that's very unlike this kitty. And I took, paid attention right away. And I was off duty that day, but put him in the carrier and covered it with a towel and took him into the emergency and, and specialty center where I see my cases, where I practice behavior medicine. And I don't practice on my own pets. And because I don't do general medicine anymore, I turned him over to one of our surgeons, and I, to Dr. Freeman. And I said, Kendra, because She's another colleague and we're on a first name basis. And I said, Kendra, would you have a look at Tony for me? He has a history of pica, eating non-food stuff. So of course she immediately took an x-ray and right in his stomach itself was this big space occupying thing. Well, took him to surgery and took out what was a big fuzzy toy. And when I brought it home in a Ziploc bag and showed it to my family, one of my sons ran into the rec room and came back with one of these toys on a stick that had the fuzzy stuff missing. He'd chewed it off and swallowed it just the day before. Well, cats can do this stuff and dogs can do this too. And it's often seen as a behavior problem and it can be, but more often, one good study showed that about 59% of cats and dogs who eat non-food items or lick surfaces excessively have chronic nausea and that these pets have a physical lesion in their stomach that's responsible for their nausea, which is why they're eating this junk. Well, of course, did a full internal medicine workup on Tony, including endoscopic stomach and intestinal biopsies. And in his case, we weren't able to find anything. Um, you know, internal medicine and behavior medicine all aspects of medicine, they can be frustrating because we don't find a diagnosis in every case. And sure enough, my pet happens to be one of the ones where we never really found the cause. So what we're gonna, what we do with him, I have tried him on Pepsid. I have used other things to soothe his stomach. Um, and bottom line with this little joker here is that we have prevented him from having access to things that he could swallow. Um, and that sometimes is the best we can do. I don't know if that answered your question, but I have to tell you that um, an internal medicine workup is in order. And that should include not only x-rays K, but also a blood chemistry profile, urinalysis, 
and uh, possibly an endoscopic evaluation with teeny tiny little biopsies. And back in my general medicine days, I did a lot of that stuff. And I found a diagnosis in every single case. Now, they usually respond to treatment. They don't always. But we can, we can help pets much better if we have an honest-to-goodness diagnosis instead of, you know, trial and error with different treatments. So um, if your general veterinarian um, doesn't do that kind of work, then that doctor can refer you to a veterinary internist who does. Um, we specialists have a real place. I'm a, I'm a believer. Oh, now you're going to play with that fish. All right. You know, I'll tell you what, cats, you have to let them make their own choices because um, we don't control them very much, do we? We have to set them up for success and let them make, make their own choices and come to us. So... Thank you for sharing some time with me and showing an interest in your pets. I love pets. Um, I love cars too, but my cats don't love cars. My dog likes cars pretty well, um, but cats not so much. So we try to make it as easy for them as possible. And you know, you're welcome to share this video with any of your pet loving friends. In fact, if you go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L, you will find uh, at the bottom of the home page, you can subscribe. And it's easy to do, you just put your email address in. And when you subscribe, which of course is no charge, I will send you my free at home pet first aid and CPR guide. It's worth printing out and keeping handy just in case. Um, but every Tuesday morning in your email box, you will get my Facebook Live from the week before. So you don't have to tune in on time or go to my Facebook page. And you can, um, and you'll get my weekly media blog, which is really my column that is in the Albuquerque Journal the preceding Friday. Um, and you can subscribe with your friends and family members too, and they don't have to be on Facebook. Many times people say, "Well, I'd, I'd see his Facebook live, but I, I don't like Facebook." I get that, but they can go to my my website, drjeffnickel.com, and subscribe, and they'll get this stuff, and they don't have to go to Facebook at all. Um, it's also on my YouTube channel. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and any questions come up, send them to me on my, uh, on my Facebook page. You can also send them to me on my, uh, on my website. You, you can go to my email there too. So, uh, so thank you again, and thanks for your commitment to your pets. And now Tony's sleeping. I don't know if you can see him here, but he's resting his little head on this fish, which I'm not going to turn on right now because it would probably upset him. So thank you again, and have a great evening. And don't forget to wear your mask.